1265, I'll give you a heads up. Uh, and as you turn to that, we're going we're gonna to read some scripture and some passages there. But if you do not own a Bible, the Bibles are in the pews for several reasons. One, so that you'll have something to study while you're here. Secondly, you may have a friend that you want to allow God's Word to change their life. This is a great resource for you to take into the mission field, which is out of these doors, and, and gift to someone that's there. Now, as we talk about contentment, I'm going to ask you just right off the bat to do something for me. I'm going to ask you if you are physically able to, to just raise your hands and just kind of lean them back just a little bit, stretch your arms out if you're physically able, okay? Yeah, ah, there you go. And then I want you to gently just kind of fold your hands together and slide them to the base of the back of your neck as you kind of lean back, you know. Oh, there, just imagine yourself in that comfy, lazy boy or lane recliner. <laughs> and then just give out that quiet, ah, like when you just finished a phenomenal meal, you know, <laughs> ah. Some of you didn't enjoy your meal. Let's try that again. <laughs> ah, thank you. I've come to realize that that may be the first time that some of you in this room have paused, have stopped all week long this past week just to go, ah, and catch your breath. Contentment. Pastor Chad challenged us in the thought process that contentment is not a place that we go. Contentment is actually an outlook and an attitude that we put on to change how we allow God to provide our needs and redirect our wants to honor him. Last week, Pastor Chad challenged our needs versus our wants, allowing God to control that in our life and to be content with God's plan and God's provision for our lives. However, some of us in this room have fallen into temptation. We've fallen into the temptation of what we classify as the money pit. And so I want to share just a little bit for you and with you this morning because in all of my research, I've come to the conclusion and the understanding that we are a nation that loves money. Let me give you some statistics that I looked up and researched for you because somehow or another, we seem to find the funds to resource our passions. So let's start out with the first one. The first one comes uh, as family debt. And these are based on the Federal Reserve statistics as of August 2014. American consumers which we all are, American consumers, owe $11.62 trillion of debt, of which $880 billion is in credit card debt. $1,127.7 billion is in student loans that we have borrowed to help improve our social status, to help improve our earning power, to help improve our intellect. We have borrowed those dollars. 8.05 trillion in mortgages. And you would think with the recent economic downturn that that debt would have gotten smaller over the last year. At least I did. Until I looked at the statistics and found out that over the last year, from August 2013 to August 2014, 10.5% increase in overall debt. We are a nation that loves money and what money will provide for us. Now let's talk about something that may be a little more relevant to this in here. Wedding costs. Any of you ever been involved in a wedding? And the cost thereof, according to CNN Money and Huffington Post Financial, they surveyed 13,000 brides and grooms. The average American wedding cost 
$30,006. I'm kind of wondering what that $6 is for, but the $30,000. In that includes approximately $14,000 on catering. Over $5,500 for the engagement ring. Over $2,000 for flowers. And every wedding would not be complete without that tedious time that takes afterwards of taking the pictures, photographs, almost $2,400 that we spend in photographs. Yet, the divorce rate is continuing to climb even with all of the spending. Just because we spend more on wedding gives no guarantee of contentment or long-term commitment. The reason being, we are a nation that loves money and what money affords us. Now, in 39 days, we're going to celebrate what? Christmas! I love Christmas. Matter of fact, this past Tuesday, it was like it was Christmas because I, I could not sleep Tuesday night thinking about the groundbreaking on Wednesday. It was like Christmas morning. Can't wait to get up. Can't wait to go and be part of Christmas. The average American, according to Gallup and their poll, spends on the average of $800 per person. Now, some of you are looking and going, that's ridiculous. I don't spend $800. And some of you are going, only $800? So if you have two in your household, that's $1,600. If you have four, that's $3,200 per household that you would spend, of which most of that money shows up in that $880 billion credit card debt starting in January because we are a nation that loves money and what money provides for us. Paul gives us some advice about money. So those of you who have have located 1 Timothy chapter 6. Read with me if you would, starting in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pangs or pains. Even with all of the pursuit of happiness... Through our earning ability and what money will buy, we are a nation of discontent people. Through our love of earning and spending money, we have developed a counterfeit hope, a false trust in ourselves, and an abandonment of a trust in God. Counterfeit hope. Now, counterfeit hope can lead to several serious issues in your life. One of the issues that counterfeit hope leads to is discontentment. Discontentment with who we are, discontentment with what we do, and discontentment with where we are going. Counterfeit hope creates sometimes an environment of discontentment. Counterfeit hope also can produce what we classify as burnout, fatigue. A bitterness in our circumstances. A disappointment in our station in life. It can also lead to sickness in our lives because we are physically worn out. We are burned out. That counterfeit hope can lead to burnout. Counterfeit hope also can lead to hopelessness. A lack of hope for the future. Hopelessness. Depression. A hopeless fear of what may take place in the future that absolutely can paralyze us from taking our next steps forward. Paul talks about it here, but those who desire, in verse 9, to get rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. 
Please allow me to share a story of discontentment with you. The subject of this story is Chet Anderson. I grew up in an upper middle class family in South Georgia. Very comfortable. Plenty of food, plenty of clothing, plenty of shelter. Grew up sitting fifth row from the back, First Baptist Church, Albany, Georgia, where I heard the gospel presented clearly. We had revival services where the gospel was presented clearly. And at age 16, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and accepted. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe that Jesus had truly raised, God had truly raised Jesus from the dead. And I became a born-again believer and follower of Jesus Christ. At age 18, I came to the conclusion that my parents had lost their mind and I knew everything. I emancipated myself, left the household that because, because I felt that I could do so much better on my own than what I was doing with their influence over me. Now, granted, I had a mother who was cooking fabulous meals for me every day. I had a mother who was washing my clothes every day. I had a mother who was cleaning the house every day because that wasn't my chore. Only thing that I really had to do was mow the grass outside, keep good grades in school, right, and get a job. That's all I had to do. But I was so much smarter than all of that, so I left all of that glory. Struck out on my own to pursue the American dream. At age 22, met and married the love of my life. God blessed us with two beautiful daughters. I continued to pursue the American dream. Divorced at age 30, eight years later. I was married forever. The reason why I say I was married forever, on that day that we took our vows and we exchanged rings, inside my wedding band, my wife at that time had engraved, I will love you forever. And forever became eight years for me. And I came to the realization that I couldn't trust forever. Still depending on myself, still growing discontent all the time, a follower of Jesus Christ, fifth row from the back, Sunday school, church training, all of the religious activities. I traded in my He-Man Woman Haters card when I found Miss Claudia, married her. She brought two phenomenal young men into our relationship, James and Michael. God trusted me with daughters again and gave us two Beautiful baby girls who are now grown, Caitlin and Carly. I was living the dream, living the life. And what is a husband supposed to do? A husband is supposed to go to work and provide for his family. The whole time that I was going to work to provide for my family, I was growing more discontent. I was in the life insurance business, and I was an agent for Liberty National Life Insurance Company, Birmingham, Alabama. I love that company. I love the resources that it provided. Growing in that, they promoted me to management, and I started managing. And by their standards, I was a top producer because I would get qualified for trips every year that they would take us for a week and wine us and dine us and have a great time at their expense. And they would hand you these trophies and tell you how wonderful you were. And they would ask you to set goals for the next year. How much more are you going to produce for us this year? And I was producing and I was leading folks to produce and money was coming in and I was growing more and more discontent with family life, with my job life, with my church life. And I developed a sickness or an illness that they call anxiety. Can you imagine me walking into a room like this, only being able to be here for about 30 seconds, feeling like these walls were closing in on me and had to run out of it, knowing the chat that you know now? totally counterculture to who I was. And I would look at Claudia and say, I have got to go. I cannot stay. So I sought professional help. Medical doctors began prescribing medicines for me to help me cope. And of course, if they're going to prescribe medicines to help me cope, there's this thing called Canadian Lord Calvert that helps enhance that. And I began to self-medicate on top of those medications. After my second DUI in five months, 
I was sleeping it off in the jail in Calhoun County, Georgia. Edison, Georgia, not my hometown, my mother's hometown, which was about 40 miles away, which was a town of about 1,600 people. And you know, in towns of about 1,600 people, you don't hide much. We're in a town of 50,000, you can't hide anything here. <laughs> but you sure enough can't hide it there. And because my wife was home taking care of the children, my mother took time off from work and came to pick me up from jail the next morning. Because, see, after your second DUI, they don't just let someone take you home. They keep you in jail overnight to teach you a lesson. And my mother pulled up in front of the jail, and they came and got me and walked me out to that walk of shame for me because I'd brought shame on the family. She had a strange look on her face, and as she looked at me, with all of that seriousness and with all of the love that a mother could give, she just sternly asked me a question that just totally spun me around. She said, Chet, why did you wait till you were almost 40 years old to get so stupid? Now, almost 15 years later, I can laugh at that statement, but at that time, my heart was broken with the next statement that she made. With a trembling lip, quivering lip, as only moms do when they're just overwrought with hurt and pain. I don't know what's going on, Chet, in your life, but I know something has to change. And it was on that short ride home, that ride of shame, that I began to realize that Chet was totally out of control. That no longer could Chet blame ex-wives and job situations and current wives and children for the circumstances that I was in because I had grown discontent with where I was in life, all of the while thinking that I was on a pursuit developed that discontent, that counterfeit hope that had led me to burnout and hopelessness and discontentment. But the story doesn't stop there. You see, three rows in front of me at that First Baptist Church that I attended was a therapist, and her name was Dr. Cheryl Gratton. Who knew me, who had prayed for me, and who for the first time I was bold enough to share. Remember, this is the get her done guy. This is the lead guy. This is the supervisor. This is the Mr. Fix-It. This is the super dad that didn't need anybody's help. Looked at a woman and said, I need help because I'm out of control. And every Tuesday morning for three years at 8 o'clock, faithfully, we would show up and we would talk. She taught me. And reminded me and encouraged me that I had a bag and that God had filled that bag with the tools to help me cope with everyday life. And she also pulled something and helped me pull something out of that bag called authentic faith. Because she knew at a point in time in my life I had accepted Jesus as my Savior. I had surrendered to him. And by doing so, she reminded me of my faith passage that I had lived by for almost 40 years. It was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding in all of your ways. Acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Because you see, the contentment really Boiled back down to, but godliness with contentment is great gain in verse 6. For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we are be content. You see, an authentic faith in Jesus Christ leads to contentment. I was worth something to God. Because I had lost all self-worth. 
I was worth something to God, not because I could produce well, not because I could love my wife well, not because I could give her what she wanted, not because I could show up and teach a Sunday school class, not because I was a deacon in a church, but because I was God's child, not because of what I could do. And for the first time in my life as a 39-year-old and a 40-year-old, I begin to realize that I was of value to God, the creator of this universe. And he loved me. He loved me so much that he gave his one and only son that if I would believe in him, I would never perish but have eternal life. I was reminded of that. It also gave me energy. Now, I don't know if you've been in the depth of depression and burnout. Energy is a phenomenal thing to have. And you can try to substitute things to give you that energy. But if you don't have it, you with me, brother? You can't get it. You can't put one foot in front of the other. Literally, you have to make yourself, pull yourself along. I had energy to thrive, not only survive getting out of bed and putting my pants on and taking a shower and going to work to provide for my family. Work became fun then because I was energizing my whole attitude changed. The same way that Miss Julie talked about. The tood changed. And it was no longer about what I could produce. It was longer about how can I help? What can I do to serve? And it also gave me authentic faith, reminded me of the hope that I had for a future life. Because at age 40, I was convinced that I would not live to be past 50 years old. Why? I do not know. But if you'd have asked me at age 39, Chet, what's your future plans? I'll be dead at 50. It really doesn't matter. Not because I was going to take my own life, but because I just bought into the lie of discontentment with that false security and that false hope and that false pursuit of what would make me happy. And I did not care. And I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you just didn't care. Wow, that's a dangerous place to be. Because the verses that Paul gives us here, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Wow. I had a hope then. A hope for a future, to live, to honor God, to live with my wife, to honor my wife, to honor my children, to provide for them. I had a hope. You see, when I married Claudia, we stood before God and we made a covenant that we would be married for a lifetime. That nothing on this earth would separate us. And those of you who know my wife know she has a gorgeous voice. And Pastor Chad Garrison actually was the officiant at my wedding and Claudia's wedding. And I saw her reach and grab a microphone. I'm going, oh boy, here it comes. And she sang this little song, tomorrow morning when you wake up, I'll be there. You see, she made a promise that day standing on that stage that no matter what happened, tomorrow morning, Chet, when you wake up, seasons come, seasons go. Trials come, trials go. I will be there. And I had all of the confidence in the world, no matter how stupid I was, my wife would be there. That could have been a mistake for me. A few years later, We were taking a little getaway. Matter of fact, it was about three years ago. And as we were coming down Interstate 40, driving along, listening to the radio, there was a, it might have been focus on the family. And there was a statement made because it was about marriage and relationship. They said, even though you have made a commitment to staying in a relationship, sometimes you may need to ask your partner this question. Have you ever considered leaving? And if so, why? And so I, driving down the road, remembering that little song that Claudia had sang to me, remembering the promise that she made to me that every morning that I woke up, she'd be there with me. Mm. Babe. So, even in my insanity, did you ever really think about leaving? 
swelled my chest down driving, just waiting to hear that positive reinforced statement that was fixing to come out of my wife's mouth, right? And there was this awkward silence. That's not generally good, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) So I reached and put the other hand on the steering wheel because this might not be good. (laughs) And I'm sure it was only a second or two that she hesitated, but it seemed like it was hours. She looked at me and with all the care and love in the world, she said, yes. Through the middle of the ditch I went, up over the other back. No, I didn't. (laughs) I wanted to. But then I just, for some reason, got angry inside. Because I had remembered a marriage that had only lasted for eight years, which was forever, by the way. And I remember a promise that a lady had made that I'll stay with you regardless. And now you're telling me you considered leaving me? I was indignant. Now, I wasn't saying any of this, but all of that was being in my head, right? And then, praise God, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Hey, idiot, she's still sitting next to you. She didn't leave you. Amen? Because <laughs> she should have. But then she followed that yes but probably not for the reason you might think. Then it really got intense. <laughs> Pay attention to the road, Chet. Oh, I run off the road. Do I need to pull off the road here and just have this talk? Because if you want to have a really good talk in a car going down the road, sometimes it's a good thing as long as you can still pay attention to the road. <laughs> She said, Chet, I love you so much, and I had loved you at that time so much that I could not come home every day watching you self-destruct and be out of control. I couldn't do it. I couldn't keep doing it because I loved you too much. And I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's pretty rich. But then she said the and word and I'm like dude that was bad enough (laughs) and Chet you had become a threat to our children and as a mother I made a commitment to look after our kids to love our kids to protect our children and Chet I would have left you had you not changed because I was fearful that you would have done something to one of our children or to me that I know unequivocally without a shadow of a doubt you would have totally regretted and I wasn't willing to take that chance. And so we continued to travel down the road. I'm sure I didn't say anything for a while. I'm processing all of this with all of this emotion that's going on, knowing that this is years behind me, but knowing the turmoil that I had put my helpmate, my best friend, the woman that loves me more than any other woman in this world, any other person, the turmoil that I had put her through. And I'm processing all of this in my mind. And I came to this conclusion. You see, what Claudia was describing at that time was me falling into that trap called counterfeit hope. But Claudia, my beautiful bride of three forevers almost now, and our four children, chose to love me and to love our children through it. And the insanity began to dissipate and the sanity began to prevail. You see, I started a journey that caused me to have to look at Chad as who he really was, not what he could do. And Scripture reminds us that sometimes in our pursuit of happiness, sometimes in our pursuit of doing things that we think are the right things to do, we can 
fall into all sorts of trap. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many things. Now there is great gain in godliness and contentment. And my question to you is, where is your path leading? I know where my path is led. It's led me to Calvary over 10 years ago. It's led me to enjoy the pride of my youth. It's led me to be in just awe of expectance of our first grandchild. It has led me to embrace the care and the love that Jesus provides. In other words, a life of contentment. That's what my path is leading to. Your path may be leading there, or your path may be leading to misery and pain. You may be engulfed where I was, but you don't have to stay there. And please hear this. There was no words that any one person could have said to me that would have probably changed the outcome of where I was headed until I hit bottom and looked up and was reminded of the cross and the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. And I praise God every day that I have a wife who loved me back to that authentic faith in Jesus Christ. I praise God that I have children that love me back. And I praise God that I have a church family who endures me on a daily basis. <laughs> Where's your path leading? Will you join me in prayer? God, your path is plain, and sometimes we make it so difficult trying to find where your path is going. So my prayer is while we stand and worship, God, you would help some of us in this room discover the path that you'd have us on. If we're going down the wrong path, Father, put people in our way to put up a roadblock. Use your Holy Spirit in our lives to surrender to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and worship?